Hi again. Glad you're here. Pull up a chair or sit back in that nice recliner or curl up on the couch, whatever, or whatever you're doing. Well, you do homework, I understand, too. Night shift people, and for you folks who are listening on radio stations all around the United States, uh, thanks again for all the kind email and our Internet audience worldwide growing all the time. So to you people who live all around this ever-shrinking and ever more troubled globe of ours, a special welcome tonight. Peter Davenport is here once a month. He is the director of the National UFO Reporting Center, a man whose sacrifice on a personal and professional level are probably unequaled in the field of ufology uh, now or at any time in the past. We're coming up rapidly on the anniversary of one of the most important UFO unidentified flying objects. We're going to make that plural tonight, events uh, in this country's recorded history. It is difficult to overestimate what happened in and over Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Probably that night, that single night with so many events, posed the biggest challenge to that element within our alleged government, which continues to put the lid on this most obvious of phenomena, the visitation of this planet of uh, strange pieces of hardware by who knows how many different intelligent races. This event over Phoenix involved Air Force jet interceptors and countless thousands of highly qualified witnesses on the ground. And to bring us a perspective on this uh, extraordinary event is Peter Davenport tonight, who has assembled, as usual, some truly stellar eyewitnesses to that event. And Peter, welcome back. Thank you, Jeff, as always. Uh, Thank you for the nice introduction. Thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, It is a credit to to coin a term to your professional wisdom, I will call it, the fact that you allow these programs on the subject of ufology. From my vantage point, they're extraordinarily important to the American people if they want to know what's going on. And I begin the program by complimenting you for putting these programs together, having us on, and allowing us the time to bring the truth to your listeners. Well, as, as our listeners would say, the pleasure is all ours, my <laughs> friend. Uh, they enjoy it uh, to no end. Uh, again, Peter does the work that our government uh, should be doing, and in point of fact, I'm quite sure the government uses Peter's goodwill and commitment to this uh, does the quintessential journalistic pursuit of, of facts and data uh, all over the country. And do remember, if you have a sighting and you don't know what to do about it, uh, just remember ufocenter.com on the web, and you can go there any time at all and use the online reporting form. There is a hotline number if it's a truly important sighting. And even if you had a sighting 20, 30 years ago, as you well know from our special feature with Peter just a few days ago, when we had Mr. Oren Sealanders on. Just an extraordinary thing happened to uh, Oren as a youngster, and it was uh, a vivid story. So don't think because you didn't see anything last week that it's not important. It is very important. This sighting over Phoenix, Peter, which I guess we're coming up on the sixth year anniversary already. Uh, fifth year tomorrow, March Five 13th. years tomorrow. Yes. Is, is probably next to what I consider to be... Uh, the biggest pre-modern UFO sighting, until I'm convinced otherwise, that that being the Battle of Los Angeles, whatever that object was, uh, 50 years ago, just a a week and a half, two weeks ago, February 1942, seen by perhaps a million or more Angelinos early in the morning, and uh, the NA aircraft guns were barking, uh, I guess, nearly 1,500 rounds and so forth. And I, I, I don't want to get into this too much, but I... I did have a friend, she recently uh, passed on, who was an air raid warden there, an extremely bright woman, who watched, after getting a phone call, out her window, this enormous object, this illuminated object, float over, pass over her residence in Culver City and move on to the southwest. And she watched the whole thing. And and I said to her that some people try to dismiss it as a a balloon, as this or that. And she laughed. She said that was a UFO. It was a craft, and they couldn't touch it. Wow. So it was quite a, quite a scene. You know, I was going to start off by saying that the uh, events over Phoenix five years ago tomorrow constituted 
in my opinion, the lead candidate for being the most dramatic UFO event in modern history, but I think you're correct. I stand corrected on that point, Jeff. Uh, the events over Los Angeles were dramatic. I've read the actual articles out of the Los Angeles Times, and yeah. uh, I tend to agree with your late friend that uh, that was some incident. I think February 26th, was it, 1942, right. did you say? Yeah, I was, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we have a number of witnesses here tonight. I have two objectives, Jeff, two objectives with tonight's program. The first one, there may be some people out there listening tonight who have never heard of the Phoenix Lights case. Or alternatively, they have heard about it, but they have accepted the apparently the government's position that it was all caused by a cluster of flares released over the Gila Bend firing range some 60 or 80 miles to the southwest of Phoenix. My first objective is to disabuse those people of those fairly veneer theories or explanations for the events five years ago. My second objective is to attempt to rival the drama that was created by Orson Welles' program, uh, The War of the Worlds, was it? Some, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, back in late October of 1938. Earlier in the program here tonight, you invited people to settle back on their couch. They may well start out the program by settling back, <laughs> but my objective is to get them on the edge of their seats before this program is over. We have five superb witnesses. This may well be the most exciting program that I have ever put together on the subject of ufology, and I invite people to stay tuned in because we're going to have some dramatic, dramatic accounts of what flew over Phoenix five years ago. During this first hour or so, uh, we have one witness standing by. I think we can identify her as Sue. If she'd mm -hmm. like to identify herself more fully, she may do so. But she is the person who called me on the night of the 13th of March five years ago to report what had just flown over her, her two sons and two daughters, out east of Phoenix. And with that, if we have her on the line, yeah. I would like to just go to her and allow her to tell her own story. Indeed. Uh, Sue, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Good evening, um, Sue. Good evening, Peter. You, you guys are old friends by now. <laughs> well, he's the one I talked to that night. Uh, we did how, become how, friends after that. How was it, Sue, to be able to uh, to reach out and connect with someone of, of Peter Davenport's integrity and, and wisdom after seeing something, which we're going to hear about in a few moments? That had to be just about a, a, a lifesaver for you. Well, it was, because nobody that I called that evening could give me any answers to what we had seen, and I started making phone calls within minutes mm -hmm. after um, this vehicle shot off to the south of my home, I went in and I called the uh, airport and uh, news stations and various people like that and could not get anything. But actually, I think it was the airport that gave me Peter's number. Very good. Okay. Go ahead and tell us, uh, tell us about it. Tell us what happened. Well, um, actually, my children had gone out of the house before I did. We were going to a, a, a concert that night. And it was a little bit, maybe 20 minutes after 8, I'm not sure, at 8.25 or so. And my daughter came running in and said, Mom, you've got to come out of here right now. Um, we've got something coming over Camelback Mountain, which is a, a landmark in Phoenix, and we live just a mile below it. So I ran outside. Uh, at that time, I had four children that were outside with me, and we just watched it. It was the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen come over my house, and it came over extremely slow. I mean, it was just kind of coming over this Camelback Mountain, which is, like I say, a landmark with lots of housing on the mountain. Mm -hmm. I live in a pretty populated area, so I'm standing there thinking, yeah, everybody is watching the same thing that we are. And uh, the kids started laying on their backs on the yard. You know, they just, laid. They laid down. Oh, they laid. So a couple of the, the two boys lay down on their backs in the in the front yard. Because it was, like, magnificent. It was lit with this kind of, um, oh, I don't know how. I, I almost, I told Peter it was almost a yellowish light like they have in parking lots. And it was uh, almost a boomerang shape. And it was, a, it was a solid vehicle. It wasn't something that was separate. It was coming right it toward your house. It was coming right at, you know, very low. It was uh -huh. flying extremely low. 
There was absolutely no sound on it. And there were, um, yeah, I can't remember. I think there were five bright lights in front. And actually, at one point, I saw a laser kind of go down. It was really strange. The wow. Kids, you know, we all saw different things. But what right. we were doing was just basically watching at a <laughs> very, very slow pace this vehicle just flying over. Just what a sight. What a sight that uh, I'm just trying to get there, and, and you're painting a beautiful picture. Let's pause and come right back, Sue. And I want to ask you more about the shape of it. Take a guess at perhaps how high it was. Maybe even a guess at how fast it was moving. So her kids, this thing was so magnificent and moving so intentionally and deliberately, they were able to lay down on the grass and just look up in the evening sky and watch. That, that's a front row seat to uh, history. Be right back. Jeff Rents with Peter Davenport, our monthly report, taking a look back five years ago tomorrow. Uh, one of the most uh, profoundly unforgettable events in, uh, in modern American cultural history, which has been, of course, swept under the rug by the mainstream media, but not here, folks. And we are very pleased to have Sue, one of our eyewitnesses tonight, and I do mean eyewitnesses, four kids outside, the boys laying down, this thing coming at them. Uh, how... How big, and you've had five years to think about this, how big do you think it was and how high above you might it have been? And this is a, 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 a I don't want to say a triangle. It was a wedge-shaped craft. How would you describe it? Yes, it was the shape of a huge, um, it was in a V, basically, a v but a very, you know, very slightly bent V. Okay, almost and a boomerang, like a boomerang, but, boomerang not quite. but it was very, you know, it was a, it was wide. A little more geometry there. Now it, it's coming at you. Are you able to get a sense that you can see height on it? Can you see it front on enough to get a feeling of maybe how thick this craft might have been, or were you looking pretty much on an underside angle? I was looking pretty much at the underside angle, but I mean, it felt close enough that the kids were waving. Oh, yeah. In the, at night in the dark and they're at waving at At night in the dark, they just thought, well, with those bright, bright lights in the front, maybe they can see us. And uh, I would say it was probably, oh, it's so hard to, to guess, maybe five miles up. Or maybe that less. high? It was that high above you? That's a long way. Actually, up. it may not have been. You know, I'm trying to think yeah. what it was less than five miles up, but okay. I, I know it was right, it had to have cleared... I don't know. It was under five miles, I'm sure. It's really difficult. Five it's miles so is, is airliner height at uh, mag, pretty much maximum altitude or close to it. That's oh, way no, up no, there. Oh, no, no, no. It was much, much lower than that because I okay. could see jets coming in around the backside of Camelback Mountain. And, uh, no, it was ah. much lower than that. All right, well, let's just say, Peter, go ahead. I, I could jump in here for just a second. We have reason to believe that the object was at 10,500 feet above okay. ground level. Uh -huh. uh, I say that because, allegedly, this object was intercepted by two U.S. Air Force F-15C fighters out of uh, Luke Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll get back to Sue here in a moment. We can discuss the height, of, as you properly implied, Jeff. Unless you know the size of the object, you can't guess the height, and unless you know the height, you can't guess the size. You need one or the other fact to be able to establish that. But I'd like to go back to Sue and... One of the things I'd like to know is how how long the object was coming at them from the north, from over Camelback Mountain, before it was directly overhead. And do I remember correctly, Sue, that it stopped and hovered above you? It was just going extremely slow. It came over the mountain extremely slow. And like I say, we're well, maybe we're a mile and a half below Camelback Mountain. Um, and... It was, we were watching it for more than five minutes. Mm -hmm. So we saw it coming, and it was going extremely slow 
when it was over our house. I mean, just barely, barely moving. And how big was it relative to the moon, please? How big was it relative to your fist clenched at arm's length with one eye closed? Actually, with my fist, it probably, I mean, my fist didn't begin to cover it. Mm-hmm. Didn't begin to cover no. it? No. I think what, you told me it was four fists. The five fists probably that w- together might have covered it. So That's between, a, oh, uh, excuse me, Jeff, One. excuse me for yeah, just closing on sure. this point. Somewhere between three and five fists positioned side by side at arm's length would just about have matched the size, the apparent size of the object in the night sky above you. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm-hmm. That's okay. as big as a large pizza, Peter. It was huge. <laughs> <laughs> and right. It was the size of several football fields. It had to be. Yeah. Oh, my. Uh, overwhelming. What are you saying to the kids? Are they scared? Or what are they saying? No, because they weren't scared. That's what was so funny about us. We were just so fascinated with this. It was really beautiful. And, you know, you're thinking, well, everybody else is looking at it just like us. You know, if we'd had time, we would have gotten all the neighbors out because I'm just assuming everyone is seeing this and that there's some explanation for what it was. So we were just going to enjoy the view. I mean, it was just absolutely, it was lit up, and it was beautiful. And we, we were watching the underneath of the of the vehicle just going over us, and it just almost looked like a city up there. There were, so many, there were lights on the bottom of it, all along the bottom of it, and there were these huge lights in front of it. And see, almost. once it got pretty much over us, we didn't uh-huh. pay much attention to the what looked like huge the huge spotlights. We were paying attention more to the shape of the vehicle from underneath. It looked almost like a city up there. It was unbelievable, like like something was floating over you that was the size of a mall, <laughs> but yeah. bigger. The, the lights on the underside, you say there were lots of... Were these lights in any particular pattern, or were they just well, they spread were along all around? the edges of the vehicle. Uh-huh. Along the leading edge, as I recall. Yeah, and but I, I'm... I know they were in the back also. Yeah. And how, and you, how, go ahead, Peter. Excuse me, Jeff. I just wanted to clarify the point. I think you placed seven lights on the leading edge, and right. you commented to Robert Fairfax, the artist who did the uh, illustration, that there was a faint glow along the trailing edge. Right, and that's what was so beautiful was the glow coming off. That's why I was saying it was almost like this, um, you know, the yellow kind of color they put on street lights. It was just, it was really beautiful because you could see the outline. We could see the absolute outline of the vehicle from the lights that illuminated from it. The main spotlights in the front, at that point, we were past that point of looking at those because, you know, this vehicle was over us. So. And that's why the, the kids started waving at it because it's... <laughs> What a, what, oh, maybe what, a, what a wonderfully human thing to do in the face of a, a, what some would call an inhuman situation. Right. Uh, just great. It brings out the best qualities in, in us folks. Waving at uh, some unknown power, which is quite clearly a long way ahead of us. Okay, we'll be right back, uh, Peter and I, with Sue. And uh, as she takes a look back in her mind's eye for all of us and five years ago tomorrow night go tomorrow night phoenix one of the biggest ufo events in recorded history right up there and the, easily in the top five if not the top two as we said at the start of the program okay so you mentioned air force jets behind the mountain 
Go ahead and tell us more about Of course, the official word is, Peter, from the Air Force, that... And we'll address that later in the program, but yeah. it's one of the reasons that I was very anxious to get Sue on the program, because when she and I first talked five years ago tomorrow night, she mentioned those jets. I still have those notes, and it clearly mentions jets to the north of the object. It came from her north, which, of course, uh, corroborates many of the other reports from north of Phoenix, and we're going to have some of those witnesses on later in the program but I wanted to start with Sue because her sighting, together with her children, brings together many of the other events that are alleged to have taken place and which, of course, the government denies ever occurred. So let's go back to Sue and hear the rest of the story. Well, when we um, were watching this vehicle go over our house, um, it was like I say, it was going extremely slow. And we continued to watch it. Um, it was over five minutes. I, I'm not sure quite how long it was. And, you know, we just went farther to the um, front of our front yard so that we could watch it go south. It was going absolutely south of our home. And it was still going, you know, it seemed like it might have picked up a little bit of speed, but it was still going slowly. And it got maybe a mile or two below us, so we were watching the, the back of it. And again, it was, a, it was a solid vehicle, I can tell you that. And then all of a sudden, it just jetted off. I mean, it just took off and to where you couldn't even see it. And that was the most fascinating. And that was probably when we realized there was something very different about what we had seen. I think in the very beginning, we just thought it was something that was just going to fly around the city at a very slow pace. And I think that was the most shocking uh, part of the event of the night when we all looked at each other like that was that was different. That was really, really something that we just saw. Hey, yeah. Sue, if you would do me a favor, just for fun, if you were to hold your hand up and move it as fast as that craft moved, how quickly would you move your arm from side to side? I don't know if I could move it that fast. I'm telling you, it almost disappeared. It, it, it just almost disappeared when we were watching. It was so huge for something like that to go as fast as a blink. I can't even, I, I, don't, I can't move my hand that fast. Very good illustration. Did, did it stop? after it made its primary jump, or did it keep right on going and vanish? It was, like I say, it was going at an extremely slow pace, and then it just it just went. It just... it just And didn't stop? No. No. Gone. I never saw it stop. We kept watching. We, we couldn't understand where it had gone, and it, uh, you know, it just went. Peter, that speed, that speed clearly would imply that a craft that big could potentially go from coast to coast in a matter of, what? Seconds or minutes. Minutes or seconds. Yes. Yeah. yes. And the pilot maybe even didn't have the pedal push very hard. Yeah. One thing I'd like to address, if Sue would permit me, I'd like to have a short interjection here. Of course, the Air Force has taken the position that uh, these were just either A-10 aircraft returning from Gila Bend firing range or it was something that could be explained away as a conventional pedestrian event on the planet Earth. We have now heard Sue describe how big it was, five fist widths in width as it passed across their head. We know that it was about two miles above the surface of the city of Phoenix at the time. This is what makes us uh, UFO investigators, the people who followed up, I, Jim Dilatoso, Michael Tanner, Tom King, uh, Richard Motzer, uh, Bill Hamilton, and some of the others we'll hear later from in this program, this fact is what makes us believe that this object that Sue and her children saw was somewhere between one and two miles in width, based on its presumed height and what everybody described as its perceived size over their heads. Now, for us, for man to have an object that size in the air is virtually impossible. 
to have an object of that size in the air that accelerates as quickly as Sue has just described for us and our listeners is virtually impossible. It's unimaginable that man could have designed that. So what a this is part of the reason I was anxious to have Sue on and have her lead off the parade of witnesses we're going to have tonight yeah. because they had, she and her children had a dramatic sighting and let me say, there are probably thousands of people in Phoenix who saw the same or a similar thing or one of the other craft that mm-hmm. passed over Phoenix together with the one that Sue described, mm-hmm. and they have not submitted written reports. Mm-hmm. I appeal to everyone who saw these events to please sit down at your earliest convenience and record the data and if they would like to use our online report form, I would be most grateful. We will turn around and share that data with anybody who goes to our website. With that, I'll get off my milk stand and turn it back over to you and Sue. No problem. We have to take a break. Let's do that. And when we come back, we'll ask uh, Sue a couple of more questions and ask her if she wants to add anything to that. I'd like to, to know, for example, how this settled in with her family routine and her kids and all the rest of it. It's... Uh, just an amazing thing to try to comprehend a a piece of hardware that big one to two miles across moving so fast that you can't move your arm that fast and out of sight okay we're back peter davenport and jeff rents here and we're talking with sue sue tell me a little bit more before i ask you about the family about the air force jets Uh, i didn't get as clear a picture of that as I, I was looking for, I didn't ask enough questions. What did you see? How many of them were there? What were they doing? Actually, um, Peter, I'm not. I don't know if my original report said that. What I might have been, what I was referring to that night were the jets behind Camelback Mountain, because at the time I was trying to compare the size of jets landing to the vehicle that was over my house. Sure, I remember that, and I think you first said that when you first saw the lights, you thought they might be a commercial airliner setting up for Sky Harbor. Right, and the jets that I think I was really, you know, enthralled with that night Uh were the ones, because that was part of our landing pattern in Phoenix, is to go, um, was to come into the city on the... um, you see, north side of Camelback Mountain, and I was looking at some of those as I was looking at the vehicle, and they were down low because they were going to swing around and land uh, over Tempe, and th- the size difference was was phenomenal. Can, can you imagine the pilots of all those aircraft not seeing something one to two miles across? I can't believe that they didn't see it because there were jets coming in um, while that was over my house. Yeah. To put it into size comparison for a moment, the width of the object that was passing over Phoenix and passed directly over Sky Harbor Airport, the width of it was equal to the length of the runway at Sky Harbor Airport. (laughs) It's like having a second airport, Mm -hmm. but one that's hovering 10 or 15,000 feet above the ground over eastern Phoenix. Big enough for a 747 to land on. I would Amazing. believe that because I know um, after I called Peter and he had asked me about the size by using my, he asked me first to use my thumb and to visualize it because it was just minutes in my mind when this had happened. And I, there was another jet coming on the north side of Countback Mountain and I said, well, my thumb certainly covers the jet coming in and it's low because it's going to land in a few minutes. And that's when I said, oh, no, Peter, I said it would take many fists to cover the size of, of the vehicle. That we I got it. All yeah. right. How about, the, how about the family? What did this do to your, your family and the kids? How did you, how did you deal with this and, and put it in its place so you could get on with life? Well, it got, it got interesting because <clears throat> we did call the airport, and then we ended up calling Peter and... Um, we were told immediately to, to draw a picture, which we did. Who to- oh, Peter told you. Yes. Uh-huh. And, and uh, so within 10 minutes of the sighting, we drew a picture, which I think, um, you know, we all sat and drew it. I had everyone sit down and draw those individually, and we all came up with uh, the same, you know, the same thing, which uh-huh. is good because it was within minutes, and that was the best way to do it. And then we described it, and then I um, 
faxed it to Peter as to what we had seen. Yep. And you know, uh, was... to give our listeners some idea of what it looked like, uh, <clears throat> the best analogy I can use is a sergeant stripes on a British uniform, sort of wedge-shaped like a squared-off boomerang, not like a strict triangle, but um, sort of like a wedge, again, like a, a British sergeant stripes on the sleeves of his mm-hmm. uniform, mm-hmm. something like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like Very a boomerang in, the, in that giant boomerang. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mentioned a flash of light, too. Would you mind taking a minute or two to describe that, how long it lasted, what direction you were looking when it occurred, where it struck the earth, and things like that. Well, you, you may I've, be. Excuse me. One other thing. You may be the only person in all of Phoenix who saw that. Certainly, the only one who's reported it to investigators. Yes, and it was um, extremely interesting to me because it was it went off to the um, west from the vehicle, so it almost was pointing downtown and it was like a flash like it was a laser it was like a laser flash to the right of the vehicle Mm -hmm. now i am probably was more under i don't know if it's coming you know i was at the other end of the vehicle but i saw it and um it was fascinating because it was a laser how long did it last how wide was it it was extremely fast it didn't stay like a flash bulb on a camera yes Mm -hmm. yes it was and what color how wide was the beam of light please it was um, oh, it was a very thin light. It, it was uh, very thin, like a laser. And did it go all the way down to the ground? It or... certainly looked like it where I was. Mm-hmm. And you're how far north of Sky Harbor Airport at this point? Where's your home relative to the airport? I am approximately um, four miles from Sky Harbor Airport. And two miles south of Camelback, roughly? That's right. Mm-hmm. And from your house, what direction did the object overhead go? Did it go over the airport or in that direction? Absolutely. It went, um, I am, I'm trying to think how many, I'm probably two miles east of the airport, which would be significant for you to know because it stayed pretty much in line of my house. And um, what it do you mean went by... right over the flight pattern. I mean, it went through their flight pattern. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to just parenthetically, Jeff, point out to our listeners that not only was this thing ultra bizarre, but it passed through what is known as a terminal control area that is controlled airspace around a major metropolitan airport. Well, we're talking FAA, the, the whole thing, uh, yes. totally regulated. Everything that moves in that airspace is watched, logged, cataloged, whatever. And it had no radio. It was not in radio communication with the tower. This is a violation of the federal aviation sure. regulations. Well, this is a, a, a <laughs> poses a potential threat to civilian aviation and military. Yeah, yeah. Cl- clearly. Well, yes, it was going against. I mean, it was going the uh, you know crisscross the flight pattern in our yeah. city at the time. Well, uh, mm. uh, just quite a story. I, do you want to see it again? Oh, I, I think it'd be great. <laughs> 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 I take a picture this time. <laughs> Do you think it could kids? have been flares? Sue, excuse me for stepping Go on ahead, there, Jeff. Do you think it could have been flares, Sue? Do you think it could have been a formation of U.S. Uh-huh. Air Force A-10s out of Tucson or the Snowbird Canadian Snowbirds aerobatic team? Absolutely not, and that's probably the most insulting thing I heard later on down the road when it was joked about on the news um, was that it could be flares. There, it was a unit. It was together. It was something that was a solid vehicle that we saw. Um, absolutely not. Yeah. And you don't think the Air Force is telling the truth when they're trying to shove this round event into a square box? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. They are not that, that was a key word. She was insulted. And I, I think so many Americans, tens of thousands of them, have been insulted over the years by having their earnest eyewitness reports dismissed, mocked, belittled, and otherwise trashed by what we call the news media. And shame on all of you men and women working in the news media who, for one reason or another, will not cover things like this with the integrity and decency that it, uh, that it deserves. And yeah. you're, you're letting your citizens, your fellow citizens, like Sue and so many others, down. You're not doing your jobs. Well said, Jeff. Yep. What a report, huh? Yes, thank you, Sue. Uh, Peter, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I think she's an American hero. She's a princess. I wish I could give her a hug from where I am. <laughs> I'd like to have her husband buy her a special dessert at dinner tonight down in California. 
Indeed. Thank you very much, Sue. It's been it's been a great uh, a great thing to hear. Uh, I just I have I'll always have that memory now of her family, her four kids. They were getting ready to go out somewhere, <laughs> yeah. And they're out on the lawn, and they see this unbelievable piece of hardware coming over the mountain, and they just the kid the boys lay down the lawn. I just that's just an amazing image yeah. to me. They were actually going to an Irish music event in Phoenix in preparation for. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh-huh. and they were a little bit delayed because of all of this. And Sue called me briefly to give me a brief report, and then when they got home from that musical event, she gave me the long version. That's when I asked her to hold up her fist. When she told me it was between three and five fists mm-hmm. in width, I that was the first time that Thursday evening that I began, that my skin began to crawl, Jeff, <laughs> that I began I to you. understand mm-hmm the full profundity of what had just happened Mm -hmm. over Phoenix that night Mm -hmm. and other parts of Arizona. But we've got four more witnesses who are, they have equally dramatic stories to tell, and we'll we'll have them on here uh, during the next several hours. I think if, if the people who settled back on their couch at the beginning of this hour are not up on the edge of their couch, they may not be paying attention. Or no, they, they are. Have... I'm getting some email now. I got one that said, uh, great description she's giving. I cannot imagine actually seeing one like that. Yeah. yeah. It, is, just, it, doesn't, it really doesn't compute. It, we have no overlay that we can put on something like that that works. Yeah. It just doesn't work. And you're stuck with something that that doesn't fit in anywhere. She actually made it to the uh, Irish Music Festival. Can you imagine the state of mind that family was in? <laughs> <laughs> Wait until you hear what the other four witnesses, if all of them are lined up. Uh, they're there. The other four are going to have to report because they're every bit as gripping and dramatic and as informative mm-hmm. as what Sue has given us just from a different perspective. Well, I watched this story uh, from from my desk here, and I I watched the the, the usual profile of how an event, a real event, is slowly but surely marginalized, pushed out of the news, and finally mocked. And it, it, you know, you were right in on this thing. Of all the researchers, uh, you had, I think, the most uh, intense connection with all of this. Uh, Bill Hamilton was right in there as well. We have to salute Bill's work, uh, but you have put more effort into this, I think, and connected more dots and come up with the true dimensions of this than anyone else. And it, it's just extraordinary to imagine that our, our the, forget the government for a minute. Let's talk about the local Phoenix radio, television, and print media. years ago, tomorrow night, Phoenix, the greater Phoenix area, southern Arizona, a series of events occurred which stagger the imagination. Peter Davenport is here for his monthly formal visit, three hours, and uh, as usual, just an incredible program. A couple of emails in real quickly. Uh, Jeff and Peter, I have always been struck by something. Eyewitness accounts are good enough proof to send people to the gas chamber, but not good enough to prove the reality of unidentified flying objects. Good point. Thanks to Jim in Indianapolis for that. Another one. Um, Peter, it seems to me that a vehicle that 
incredible in size and moving that fast would create some sort of a devastating shockwave. What about that breaking the sound barrier thing? Quite clearly that, uh, that machine stepped through the speed of sound with no apparent shockwave. That, again, could be easily attributed to a technological advance, which we can't figure out at this point. Yeah, that's a very good point. Clearly, the object was moving at supersonic velocities when it departed to the south, as Sue described last hour. <clears throat> One of the things that we observe with UFOs is they're able to pass through the atmosphere at unimaginable velocities and not generate sonic booms. This happened the 13th of March last year over Seattle. I think we had some of those witnesses on this very program. Uh, I go back a year further, the 28th of April, year 2000. These cases are all on our website. Anybody may read them. An object went over Seattle at a blistering pace between 4,000 and 6,000 feet per second. It was 4,200 feet above ground level, level, we calculated. It went from Seattle to Alder Grove, British Columbia, uh-huh. in a matter of seconds, and it generated no sonic boom. The writer is exactly correct, Jeff. Wow. All right. Let's uh, bring our next guest on. I'll let you do the introductions, please. Dennis is online. I'm very pleased to have this witness, Dennis, with us tonight. This is the gentleman who he was the first one to call the National UFO Reporting Center and apprise us of the existence of this phenomenon as it was taking place in Phoenix, for which I will remain indebted to him to the end of my life. He called, he gave a very cool, very objective, very seemingly accurate, complete report, and within a matter of seconds of his call, Our hotline here in Seattle started lighting up like uh, the proverbial Christmas tree. The the first witness, Sue, was down in Phoenix. The next two witnesses we're going to have on were actually able to see the object before Sue and her uh, sons and daughters did, if Mm -hmm. we're talking about the same object, and Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's the case. Mm -hmm. But Dennis was, I think he was about 50 miles to the north of Phoenix in the town of Paulden, Arizona, almost straight north of Prescott and Prescott Valley, and he was driving away from his house, and what he saw was so dramatic that he turned his vehicle around, as I recall it, returned to his house to get his binoculars and get other people outside. With that, let us go to Dennis and let him tell his own story. Hi, Dennis. Welcome to the program. Hi, Jeff. Peter. Good Good evening, evening, Dennis. Good evening. Dennis, you're a former police officer. How long uh, were you serving in that capacity? Uh, Approximately 17 years, Jeff. All right, just to give our listeners an idea of the uh, the quality of uh, Dennis's background and the kind of person he is, uh, one of one of America's finest. Okay, Dennis, tell us what you saw. Well, it was a uh, March 13th, tomorrow evening, uh, five years ago, and it was uh, in northern Arizona. Actually, we're located about 140 miles north of Phoenix, and we're in a, uh, a higher elevation, approximately you know, 4,500 to 5,000 feet in elevation, so our, our nights are very clear. I live in an extremely rural area. We have no light pollution. We don't, uh, we're so far from a metropolitan area, we don't have much smog. We have very, very clear nights. As I recall that night, it was um, very dark. There was no moon out. The stars were uh, exquisitely shining. They were very brilliant. And I left my home with my wife and was uh, northbound just shortly after 8 o'clock in the evening. Uh-huh. And uh, I looked off to my left and noticed five lights in the sky. Uh, they were there was one light in front, like a point light, uh, and then two, and then one in the rear, kind of a diamond shape, and then another one behind it, as though it was a, a, a tail to a kite. And these lights were not traveling very fast. They were, if I was to equate it to something I would normally see in the air, it would be uh, about the speed of a helicopter or helicopters. Uh-huh. And it was so unusual, I had to stop the car, and I got out. It was very cold out, but I got out nonetheless and looked at the objects, and, and I don't get excited too much. I've seen a lot of action as a police officer and learned to stay calm and, and look at things objectively. Sure. And uh, th- these were so unusual that I, I hollered at my wife to get out of the car and look at this. Check this out. So she gets out of the car and looks, and she goes, oh, my God, what is it? And I said, I have no idea. And they were moving fairly slowly. They seemed to be... Uh, in symmetry, there was never any variation in their distances from each other or in the shape, uh, design of the lights. It was I was unable to really tell if it was. I wasn't even thinking at the time. 
if it was one object or five different objects. Uh, I think Peter asked me later, uh, sometime later, about that. And I, I, I seem to recall the initial reports I was reporting five separate lights. And I think the reason why is because the night is so dark that perhaps I saw stars in between the lights. I, I'm thinking. I don't know. I don't recall. I couldn't sure. be 100% sure if it was one mm-hmm. object or five separate ones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's my impression. We were so... Uh, aghast at this, like, like Peter said, we had jumped back in the car, went back to the house, and I, I hollered at my kids, we've got a UFO, <laughs> and because uh, they had never seen anything like this before ever, and mm-hmm. uh, my son come out, and he, he observed it, and I didn't even think to grab the video camera, but these objects moved, um, if we were to equate it to a helicopter, I would guesstimate they were about 2,000 feet in elevation and moving about the speed of a helicopter, and they moved in the direction toward Phoenix from the north-northwest. Uh, and actually a direct line for me to Las Vegas as a crow flies, I would guess, and then moving in a direction towards Las, uh, towards Phoenix, I'm sorry, uh, about 130, 140 miles away. And as they passed by, these lights were larger. They weren't like any lights I'd seen in the sky ever before. They were round. They were uh, an amber, orangish color, as I recall. Uh, there was no variation in their intensity or in their color. Uh, they just remained the same same formation and kept moving at that slow pace. They passed by to the south and oh, after viewing them for about 90 seconds or so, each light started to blink off. Now, I don't know whether they actually were turned off or, or, or perhaps it was just a, a light shining forward and as it passed by it would disappear from sight or what, but each light individually blinked off in a matter of no, oh, 15 or 20 seconds, the lights were essentially gone or not visible any longer. Uh-huh. That, Could it have been that the craft turned away and you didn't see the lights at that point? Or do you think they were extinguished? Uh, it's hard to say if they were, um, like, like I said, it's hard to, I'm unsure if they were extinguished mm-hmm. and turned off, as it were, as right. it were or, or if they were just going out of sight individually, right. were shining you, forward, so to speak. Were you ever able to discern a solid shape against the night sky? Was it was it blocking out any of the stars? If this was a single item, was it blocking any stars out? You did indicate you felt you might be able to see stars through it, but that's a it's a pretty difficult call at, at in those circumstances. You're absolutely correct, and I, and I don't I don't have a clear recollection of that. My my impression was that they were five different objects. Mm-hmm. And I based that on thinking uh-huh. possibly that I could see stars, but that's not a, a real concrete, definitive P- Peter, recollection. Very good. Uh, Peter, what, what is the time frame with Dennis's sighting mm-hmm. and Sue's well, sighting? Approximately five, maybe ten minutes ahead of time. Dennis called me at 8.17 p.m. Uh-huh. Now, I don't know how many minutes before you called, Dennis, you had first seen the objects. I'm guessing maybe five? Correct. So you saw them, I would guess, at about 8.10 to 8.12 p.m. We heard Sue Watson say that she saw hers at about 8.20 to 8.25. So, Dennis, I'm looking at a, uh, a map here in front of me. I estimate that as the crow flies, Paulden, Arizona is to the north-northwest of Phoenix by about 90 to 100 miles. That's my estimate. I may err on that. So these objects were able to cover, a pro- if we're talking about the same object, I'm not sure that's the, the case, and we'll talk about that later in the program, Jeff, but if we're talking about the same object, the object was able to cover 100 miles in about 5 to 10 minutes, approximately. That's not without, too shabby. Not with, without generating a sonic boom. Clearly, right. that is supersonic velocity. And, that, and that's another point there, uh, Peter and Jeff, is that these these lights there were no there was no noise whatsoever, nothing, no noise, and that that was the unusual thing to me. There was no sound of the the rotor beating of a helicopter, of a jet, yeah, propeller of an aircraft. I understand. All right, stand by, and we'll take this break and return in just a couple of minutes.
be right back. Peter Davenport and I, and Peter has assembled just some extraordinary witnesses to the Phoenix Lights. I'm not sure if that's the best name we can hang on this amazing event. Five years ago tomorrow. Um, Dennis, are you still there? Okay, I'm not hearing. Are you there, Dennis? Yes, I am. There he is. Okay. What an extraordinary sight that must have been. How long, again, Dennis, do you estimate you were witness to those lights? Oh, well, time enough to uh, drive back to the house, get the kids, stand on the porch and watch. I, I would guesstimate uh, two minutes, maybe. Mm-hmm. Huh. And they were to the west of Paulden, is that correct? They were, uh, slightly to the west. Uh, if, if overhead was 12 o'clock and I was facing north, uh, looking at a clock, they would probably be about 10 o'clock. Mm-hmm. How... how uh... How close? Take a guess. It's tough. We're not going to hold you to this, of course, but just give us a wild guess. Mile? A mile would be a good guess, yes. Mm-hmm. yes. How, how big were the individual lights? I think you said you saw five of them. Yes, they sir. were yellow-orange. Each of those five lights, could you estimate what their apparent size was from your vantage point, for example, relative to a bright star in the sky or relative to the full moon? If you were to hold a pencil at arm's length, each light was about the size of the eraser of that pencil. So very big. Yes, they were. Very and, prominent. Yes. And again, they all moved in unison, correct? Yes, in, in sync, right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did, well, they, right. Did, the, did the cluster of them, Dennis, maneuver at all, or was it absolutely rock-solid, just gliding across the sky in an unwavering fashion? Very good description. Rock-solid, uh, gliding. I mean, they, they remained in sync. They never varied in speed in direction uh, or in distance from each other uh, as though it could have been one object with five lights. Yeah. And uh, one more question, if I may, Jeff. Um, <clears throat> you've seen aircraft in formation, Dennis, I'm sure, at air shows and aerobatics demonstrations and things like that. Just to, if you <laughs> would forgive me, to belabor the point, to put the wooden stake through the black heart of the Phoenix Lights, um, How solid, how stable, how unwavering in its flight was that cluster of five lights relative to a formation of aircraft, would you say? And I'm asking for an opinion there. I I recognize. It was much smoother. It was slower and much smoother. Uh, It was just, like you said, gliding was a very good descriptive uh, and adjective to use for that. Yep. Did the color, excuse me for interrupting, did the color of the lights waver or change at all, or was, was that an yeah, sort of an immutable part of your sighting. Uh, they did not change, as I recall. They remained that amber color. Mm-hmm. Uh, I might add that we, uh, I'm quite a sky watcher most of my life, and we see satellites out here in the late evening hours when the sun's just right. You can see satellites going across the sky. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I've seen lots of things in the sky over the years, and I'm able to, to, in my mind, go through the filing cabinet of my mind, well, those are satellites, that's a balloon. And, but these, I could not pinpoint what they could be equated to, and that's what was so unusual. And when I got out of the car and there was absolutely no noise whatsoever, I think that was the, the, the biggest point that just drove home to me. This is something not normal. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, you may have been the first uh, person to really, I guess, witness this, this chain of events that night, uh, Peter. Yeah, I think... Uh I think Dennis was one of the first in the state of Arizona to see it in order to record it and Mm -hmm. or to report Mm -hmm. it. We have no that I'm aware of. Now, some of the other investigators, uh, Jim Delatoso, Michael Tanner, uh, uh, Richard Motzer, and Tom Taylor, and many others may have witnesses to the north of Polden, Arizona, but I'm not aware of it. I'm just not familiar enough with their data to be able to say. But, boy, what a wonderful description, uh, Dennis of its size, uh, just how it looked. And going back to a question that Jeff posed to our earlier guest during the first hour, how did this affect you or how did it affect your family? Did you talk about it? Did you look at the news reports locally? What were what were your impressions after the sighting? Uh, initially, of course, there was quite a bit of excitement in the household. Um, and I was rather reluctant to call, but then called the sheriff's office and asked them if they had any reports. Um, and they had nothing. That's when they connected me with Peter, you, and uh, we, t- we, we talked. 
Uh, the next morning, it didn't seem to affect the family too much. Uh, some of the usual lights in the sky, it was like, so what? You know? <laughs> the kids were 9 and 11 at the time, and oh boy, it's like a circus thing. Yeah. And um, the next morning, I, I called, I worked for a radio station at the time, and I called the, the news lady at the radio station, asked her if she had any reports. It was about mm-hmm. 6 or 7 in the morning. She said, mm-hmm. no, we may have one in Prescott Valley close by here. But uh, no, and she dismissed it. And later that day, I mean, it was headline stuff. Yeah, it was everywhere. Dennis, you were listening uh, when Sue was on earlier. Let's just say you're working for Phoenix Metro. I don't know what the name of the, the PD down there is, but you're on you're on duty. Uh, you get a call. Dispatch says a woman over in such and such says she sees something. You you stop the car. You're nearby. You look out and you see something like Sue described. What would you, as a police officer, do? How would you handle that? I probably would. If I, I had an occasion when I was a police officer, I had a sighting many, many years ago. And, and ironically, if, if I can allude to that for just a moment, we had had um, a report in briefing. This is probably back in the 70s in Southern California. We had a report in briefing that if we see anything unusual in the sky, we're to immediately report it to dispatch so that they can report it to the authority that wanted this information. Mm-hmm. Well, ironically, a week later, something I, I observed something very unusual. So in your scenario, I would have followed that same conduct. I would have probably picked up my microphone and advised dispatch what I was observing mm-hmm. so that others could at least perhaps have a chance to look and have a recorded record of that. Very good. Would it have been something you'd want to kind of chase after in the car if you had a chance? Uh, if I could fly. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Stand by, uh, gentlemen. We'll be right back with more in just a couple of minutes. And we rejoin Peter Davenport and Dennis. Dennis, I want to wrap this up. Anything you want to add to uh, what you've uh, so eloquently stated? Well, the only thing that, that Peter and I were talking during the break, and, and, and Sue, your, your uh, witness, you spoke to, I, I heard a little bit of what she was saying, and she touched on a point that... Uh, drove something home to me and and I think when we make these reports we, we want, we, we're trying to find out what these are and the government becomes involved with it or a government entity whether it be local, state or federal I don't get the feeling we're getting any assistance we get ridiculed if you will uh, insulted was a good word that I think Sue used Yeah. And, and the feeling to me is that the government knows more than what they're telling uh, that's the attitude that I have. Otherwise, they would be there by our side helping us to solve this mystery as to what sure. it was. Sure. Uh, the, the question of flares came up. Peter asked me about that. I absolutely laughed when I heard that news report. Uh, there definitely definitely were not flares. Uh, not not what I saw anyway in, in the northern part of the state. Yeah. Boy, what a fantastic report, Dennis. Uh, you know, for years I've said the best reports we get are from uh, members of law enforcement. They're just good observers. They're sober-minded. Uh, they're accustomed to looking th- at things while they're in the field and so on and so forth. And uh, I'm really grateful to you for your willingness to come forward <clears throat> amidst a busy schedule. I think you perhaps even may be on work- at work now. I- I've forgotten, but uh, <laughs> I'm really grateful to you for having done that Uh that's a great report. Well, it's my pleasure, Peter. Thank you, Dennis, very much. Uh, good to talk with you, and maybe we'll talk again. Thank you, gentlemen. Good night. Good night. Okay, excellent. Let's uh, let's move Boy. right ahead uh, into our next witness, uh, if you'd like, uh, Peter, unless you want to add something to that. It was outstanding by every measure. Boy, wasn't that something. Yeah. Let's go into this third witness. <clears throat> I'll give a brief introduction This gentleman, like Sue, had the object fly right over him. He, like Sue, had a number of witnesses with him at the time. But this gentleman, and uh, I think he's going to go by the name of Dan. We'll leave it to him to uh, share his last name if he wishes to. No need to necessarily. But I think he was just outside of Dewey, Arizona, which is sort of southeast of Paulden, Okay, now help. Help. Uh, let me just for a second help set this up in our listeners' minds while we get uh, yeah, Dan's connection idea. solid. Well, he's mm-hmm. there now, but uh, Dewey is where again, Peter? I think it's uh, generally north of Prescott or north northeast of Prescott and Prescott Valley, 
but it is southeast of Paulden, where Dennis was. Oh, okay. So Sue was down in Phoenix. We've now jumped up to the north from Got where it. these object, uh, objects came, uh-huh. essentially from Henderson, Arizona, which is on, or Henderson, Nevada, which is on the southeastern corner of Las Vegas. So the next witness we're going to hear, mm-hmm. Dan, mm-hmm. saw the object roughly, I estimate, perhaps 30 seconds or a minute after Dennis had had his sighting, Again, I'm I'm basing this statement on my presumption that they saw the same object, and that may not be the case. We may be dealing. In fact, we are quite. We investigators are quite sure that there were several objects over Arizona that night. I happen to not know how many there were. Other investigators may be more sure on that point. But with that, why don't we go to our next? I was going to say victim. Our next guest. <laughs> And just yeah. throw the table open to him Good. and allow him to tell his story of where he was, what he was doing, and what he saw, and what the object did. All right. Welcome to the program, Dan. Hi. Hi. Good evening, Dan. Hi. Thanks for coming on tonight. No problem. Does it seem like five years ago already? Uh, yeah, I basically tried to forget about this. Oh, I'm sorry. Tell you the truth. <laughs> We're in trouble now, Peter. No, that's yeah. okay. Uh, should I just go ahead and tell you what happened? Please do. Okay. Well, I live in Dewey, Arizona, and it's approximately five to six miles from Prescott at Valley, Arizona. And we were going to go bowling that night, and I had my children and a friend, two friends actually, with me in the car. And we were heading north on Highway 69, and uh, we saw, saw some lights off in the distance to the right-hand side of the road, and we weren't sure what they were. We thought maybe they were a building was being erected in that area up there. But we noticed, after looking more, that these things were starting to move. And we knew there wasn't anything really over in that direction other than that building. So I told the driver to speed up. We'll go find out what this thing was. And uh, as we got closer, we, got, we could see these things better. Uh, we sped up and we slid into this shopping center in Prescott Valley, Arizona. And... Uh, as we got out, it was a V-shaped object. It had five lights, and it came over the top of us, probably 1,000, 1,200 feet in the air, uh, fairly slow. It crossed over the top of the shopping center, and this thing was as big as a Safeway supermarket, so this thing was huge. Uh, it crossed, crossed the shopping center over our heads, went across the street, veered toward Phoenix, and got after it in a big way. And, I mean, it... It, it moved probably, you know, 35, 40 miles in just a few seconds. A but, few uh, seconds, just a few seconds, just zip. Uh, let's do this break and come right back. Uh, big as a Safeway supermarket? Yes, sir. Uh, enormous, okay. There was uh, a plane above this thing. Oh, okay. my. So. All right, stand by, we'll be right back. Again, any of you in the Phoenix area or Arizona who may have seen something important still have an opportunity, of course, to file an online report. Your anonymity will be guaranteed. Go to ufocenter.com. We can use all the reports we can get as this story continues to take on uh, added dimension with each new eyewitness. We're talking to Dan now, who saw an item that was uh, as big as a Safeway supermarket. Now, let's do the uh, arm's length thing, Dan, if you would. When you looked up and saw this... He, he, he may be gone, Jeff. We had some interference on... Oh. This, some serious interference on the line during the break, but uh, <clears throat> perhaps the engineer, if he's monitoring, can uh, get him back on the are line. We, are we reconnected? 
guy. We're pulling him up right now, so he'll be back yeah. in just a few moments. Uh, I want to get that perspective again. Uh, Safeway Supermarket, that's huge. How high was it? The higher it goes, the smaller it gets. Uh, again, this is a V-shaped object. Is, is this Sue's craft, do we think? I believe so. But at this stage, while we're getting Dan back on the line, let me throw out this little tidbit, Jeff. Sue's object was like a chevron. I think that's probably the best term. Okay. It had a notch out of the back. Uh, mm -hmm. It looked like a boomerang with squared off wing tips or squared off tips. Mm -hmm. There was another object that was reported by many, many people and thoroughly investigated that looked more like an isosceles triangle with a square back, that is a straight line on the back. And this is what, in part, makes many of us investigators think that we're not dealing with just one object, uh -huh. one to two miles in width, that mm -hmm. was able to fly mm -hmm. at supersonic speeds, hover, and accelerate at a blistering pace, unimaginable, unimaginable mm -hmm. pace, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're dealing with two or more. There was also a gigantic disc reported by at least one witness who saw it streaking from east to west over Phoenix that night. There were also fireballs the next night. We are talking about a potpourri uh -huh. of ufological events, I believe, that took place over the course of an estimated one to two hours that stretched from Henderson they streaked down to Phoenix, they went down to Tucson, and many, many other parts of Arizona. Probably this, these objects, one or more of them, were was reported from probably 30 towns or cities across Arizona. This isn't just a little glimmering light in the distance. Right. We're talking about a mass event, and that's the reason five years after it, we're focusing on it again tonight. All right, we have Dan back. All right, Dan, uh, if you look up and this item is overhead, uh, as big as a Safeway supermarket, if you were to hold something in your hand or hands, uh, how big would it? How big would it be? Now you'd be holding your hand up and looking at a Safeway, a Safeway supermarket. <laughs> That's how big it would be. Hold I mean, up your. Excuse me, Jeff. Uh, hold up your fist at arm's length. If, if you, you would, held Dan. your fist up at arm's length, you look at your fist and then you look at the Safeway supermarket. Uh huh. It was that big. So the object you saw was about as big as your fist held at arm's length with one eye closed. Yeah, I, I have a telescope. Uh, you know, I deal with that kind of stuff. I mess around with that kind of stuff. This was close. This wasn't far away. Yeah. We were on top of it, and I was so excited. I went to the bowling alley, and I called our airport. They said they didn't see anything or have anything on radar. They gave me Luke Air Force Base's number. I called them, and uh, they didn't know anything about it. And they gave me your telephone number, and then I called you. Yeah. They claimed not to know anything right. about it. They <laughs> also claimed that nobody had called them that night, well, not have, anybody. I have phone. I have the receipt of my phone bill yes. with the number on there, so I know that, you know, I did call, and I have, I have proof of it. So, And I called KPHO News. I called everywhere I could call because I was really excited. How were you, re how were you greeted at KPHO News? What did they say? No were big they, deal. Were they no big deal. They just, you know, took the information. Didn't really go to any extremes, the extremes to talk to me, and that was that. How did that uh, increase your confidence in the reliability of these so-called local well, I know, news you media? Know, I saw it in the paper the next day, and then five signings and our governor made a big spiff out of it, you know what I mean? And they made a joke out of it, and they put the flares in the air. They did this and they did that, but what yeah. I saw wasn't a flare. Yeah. It was a, some kind of a craft. I don't know that it was a spacecraft. Yeah. But it was a craft. It was in the air. It flew over the top of us. My son won't even talk about it at all. He still won't. No, because he, he knows what people think when he, you know, he tries to talk about it. There's he's still, there is still a negative reaction. In other words, what you're saying, a lot of people in, in your area <laughs> bought into the media cover-up. Sure. Yeah. You know, Five Simonton uh, put somebody in a, uh, a little you know, a little outfit and bring him, you know, they walk him around on the, yeah. in front of the television and everybody believes that, you know, we're all a joke. And pretty a sickening. Joke. Pretty sickening. Uh, it, 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 this whole idea of our own Air Force lying to people. Why, why couldn't they say, yes, we have reports? Well, here's where the way they, I look. I'm 50 years old and I've looked in the air a lot over my life. And yeah. I've never saw anything before or probably never will have seen anything like that again. That was yeah. a one-time thing. And I look... All the time now, constant because because I, because I don't know what it was. I can't explain it. And hey, you'd, you'd like another chance, would you? Sure, say? I would. I'd like somebody to call me and tell me when it was. Yeah. Maybe, did, that, maybe, did, did, did that Dan? Did that when you looked up and saw that? 
did how did you fit this may sound a little off the wall but how did you physically feel at that moment did you get a jolt through you did you have a well yeah did I you, felt, my stomach felt uneasy i uh yeah, I did. My stomach felt really uneasy. It would almost have to, Peter, I'm thinking. The people to see something that huge, that enormous, yeah. and know damn well it's no airliner. No, no it wasn't. No I know what a 747 looks like in the air. You know, yeah. I know, you know, this thing would have ate one of those for lunch. This thing was huge. It was the size. I don't know if you have Safeway where you're at, but a supermarket. Yeah, I understand. Large, yeah. really large. You know, and, and, the, and the parking lot's the size of a football field. Yeah. It's, it's hard. a shopping center. It's hard to know how big it was, Dan, because you don't know how far away from you it was. Well, All I know we that there do... was a plane to the right of us and above. Yeah. So I have a pretty good idea because he was going. The plane was heading toward our airfield. Yeah. And I know that when they come in, they come in at around three thousand feet. This would have been a commercial airliner. No, it wasn't. This is a small airport, and this is a small plane. That's okay. what I know. That the flying area around here is around three thousand ah. feet. So yeah. it had to be below that. Well, I don't think so, Dan, because it's impossible, physically, utterly, no question about it, impossible to look at a strange object in the night sky if you don't know how big it is, to know how far away it is or how high it is. You have perceptions, but those perceptions don't mean anything. Unless a small plane flew behind it and was screened out by it, then That's you might right. have a good no, guess. No, that wasn't that way. This thing was to, would have been to the uh, north, uh -huh. the north, East side of it. Can the you object, imagine if you were in a plane, Dan, uh, flying around that night? You you would have had to have seen it, wouldn't you? I think so. Yeah, there'd be no way not. Do yeah. you, I saw it from ten miles away mm -hmm. the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and we got on top. Like I said, when we got there, then it flew over top of that that shopping center. It took up more than the Safeway building as it came over the top. It wow. came over slow, because it was slow enough for us all to look at it, you know, and ooh and ah and all were that. Were there any other thing. people in the parking lot looking? Yes. Yeah, there were other people out there. Besides your group? Well, yeah, the park, it was a parking lot. There were people all over the parking lot, you know, well, parking and, cars, getting in and out. Yeah, and we didn't they, know if the store was open or not. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. I see. And, and were they, they looking up? Could, at night. Did you hear them looking up and buzzing and talking about this? I wasn't this? paying attention to any of those people, other than, I, you know, after, the, after it was over with, we got in our car and ran for a phone. So you didn't go bowling. You turned oh, around. Oh, yeah, I went to the bowling alley, <laughs> ran in. They all thought we were crazy. You know, first thing I did, they, all these people that I bowl with, I just ran in and started saying, hey, I just saw a UFO, and they're looking at me like I'm an idiot. And the next day, it comes on the paper. Well, the next time I go to the bowling alley, everybody wants to talk now, you know, yeah. because. Yeah. But, yeah, it was really crazy. And my wife, uh, I, she directs the school district, uh, the busing around here, and I guess one of her drivers saw it, too. Yeah. How How could it be that a parking lot full of people wouldn't, see something like this so big right overhead well, they'd, they'd have to have. yeah and not report it to the news or not report it to the national oh, UFO got reported to the, well I, I have a hunch it was reported but as we've heard so many times the the people on the other end of the phone will take the notes file them in the round container and forget it well there was people you know there are other people in, in the alley that were investigating this also and they came up here and we all met at a you know, a company in uh, Prescott Valley and talked this all over with uh -huh. these other people. There were probably 15 or 20 of us up there that these people interviewed. Yeah. And we went to the parking lot together, and uh, he told me to put my, that's why I knew that question. He told me to put my fist in the air, you know, uh -huh. that type of thing, and see what I could say. You've got to be kidding, right? This is like having a house over top of your head. Okay, but relative size, Dan, relative size is different from your perceived Okay. Size estimate of what its absolute size was. So if it was roughly the size of your fist held at arm's length, we had an earlier witness on tonight who, when it went over Phoenix, well south of you, it, we believe, I believe, it was lower. It had descended. When it went over Prescott, we have reason to believe it was at about 18,000 feet. Well, if it was, then it would have to be and longer. Yeah, when it yeah, that is our impression. It was eighteen thousand feet, and that is because I believe that plane that you alluded to reported it. It may that may have been the small plane coming in from Denver or Colorado Springs that okay. reported the object to Luke Air Force Base, and it was based on that report that Luke may have scrambled jets because we have an unconfirmed report that the person who was flying a private twin-engine aircraft, a it was a Cessna twin-engine 421, okay. 
had the object fly in front of his aircraft, and it completely obliterated his view of Prescott and Prescott Valley. I can imagine. So he got on the horn. He was a senior, retired senior military officer, (laughs) and he reported it to Luke Air Force Base, predicated on the fact that he was general or above. They scrambled jet fighters to go after that object. Was there a time frame in that? I mean, what time? Did he have a time? About 8.15, which was about the time that that you you saw the object. Yes, the times are correct. The locations are correct. Uh And do you have any idea what type of airplane you were looking at? I just knew it was a small plane. You couldn't tell whether it was single engine or twin engine or jet or otherwise. No, it definitely wasn't a jet Mm -hmm. because it wasn't going fast. I don't believe it was going fast enough to be a jet. Yeah. But... But, yeah, it, it was a small plane. And, and, like, and like I said, the people that were with me, there's only one out of the whole, all five that really has ever really talked about it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. They, just, they just hushed up. <laughs> they didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to uh, be thought of as crazy. Yep. Yeah. Well, That's what uh, they were implying, you know, that we were all pretty much idiots. You, you to know. Put it off as a flare. And mm-hmm. I just, you know, <laughs> yeah. that had to it make had you... toward Phoenix from here. Uh-huh. Okay, and, and they saw it in Phoenix, so it... Everybody, I think, saw the same thing. The, the flare story had to make you a little angry, I would oh, think. Very angry. Very angry. You know, and uh, and, and people bought it. Yeah. Well, people it's, bought it's, them. It's the easy way out for a lot of people, uh, Dan. Uh, Peter, I think we can wrap this up and uh, thank Dan. Dan, thank you very much, Dan. Okay. Dan, thanks a lot for... for uh, revisiting this and it's you made a big contribution we appreciate it no problem all right okay uh wow we have two more guests our next hour uh peter if people aren't on the edge of the edges of their couches <laughs> now i can't help them yeah that's it <laughs> we've got we'll, two, uh, two wonderful witnesses coming up i hope people will stay tuned okay we'll be right back uh, after the top of the hour break and see you then See if you're new to the program, and Peter Davenport, I'm sure you can spell that. Peter is here once a month. He is the director of the National UFO Reporting Center, online and on the clock, around the clock, every day for you, 24-7 at ufocenter.com. Online report forms are there for you. Current sightings, past sightings, sightings from the 1930s and 20s, events, experiences, unusual occurrences, all welcome. We have two more guests this hour as we look back at five years ago already, tomorrow night. The uh, second most dramatic, and maybe the first, sighting of an unidentified flying object in recorded American history. I, I, the, the numbers are one thing. The artillery was impressive, but the... the Absolutely graphic overwhelm, the sensory overload of seeing something that big, that low, that close uh, is amazing. And we're, it's certainly one of the top two. Maybe we'll have to have a tie. Hard to say. We had so many people potentially out that night, too, Peter, who could have seen it. Yeah. <clears throat> we just don't know. We don't know. Before the program, Jeff, I counted the number of reports that we have posted to our website that have come to us from the online report form over our website. Uh, it's only 35. I, Some of them quite dramatic, many of them from the very witnesses we've listened to or will listen to tonight. Uh-huh. Uh, it goes back to a statement you've heard me say many times on your program 
out of a thousand people who see something like that, no matter how dramatic it is, only about one or two out of those thousand will take the time and trouble, the five or ten minutes it takes, to submit a report. It is, uh, it is sort of frustrating. I have to be honest. I, I try to speak honestly, even bluntly when necessary. It is sort of frustrating to a UFO investigator like me to work as hard as we do and to not to not have people take the five minutes required to sit down in front of a computer and submit reports so we have material to work with. Had these people whom we've heard already tonight not gotten in touch with us, not submitted reports, we would not have the possibility of putting on a program like this. Those reports are mm -hmm. crucially important to us. But one other thing before we go to our next guest, who really does not need an introduction on this program, as I'm sure you'll recognize, <clears throat> one of the things I'd like to bring to our listeners' attention, we have now heard three witnesses, we're going to hear two more in the next hour, at about the time that all of these events are taking place, the President of the United States injured his knee in the home of Greg Norman down in Florida. Greg uh -huh. Norman, the Australian golfer. Uh -huh. I think I've shared with your audience before, and I'd like to do it again. Many of us have a suspicion, and unfortunately it's little more, can be little more than a suspicion, because we don't have access to the data inside the government. Mm -hmm. We have an unconfirmed and unconfirmable report that U.S. military forces were placed on a DEFCON 3 footing that night that is up from a normal 5, passing 4, going directly to 3 possibly as a result of this UFO sighting. At the same time, the president is injured, in fact, quite, uh, quite seriously injured, requiring surgery back up in Washington, D.C. The question is, in my mind, and this is pure surmise, I wish to emphasize that, was the president of the United States injured in response to the declaration of a DEFCON 3, which in turn was a response to the UFO sighting over uh -huh. Arizona? If not, that tells us that the U.S. Air Force is sitting on its thumbs, that an object two miles wide can go right over Sky Harbor Airport, apparently be intercepted by U.S. Air Force jets, and they don't tell the commander-in-chief. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I don't think so. No, I like your thinking. I like the logic line. It's, uh, it's very pragmatic. Uh, when they hustle the commander-in-chief, they make him move. Yes. And uh, people are human. They trip. They fall. Whatever. Sure. Uh, yeah. A very logical uh, proposal. I throw that out again because I dare say yeah. we probably have listeners tonight that we've not had before. Oh, yeah. Or who may not have heard this theory. And it is only a theory, but I think it's plausible. Whether it's correct or not is the only remaining question. And then it would come... <laughs> Contrast that with uh, President Bush reading to the elementary school children and then advised of the World Trade Center impact, and he goes right on reading. Yeah, yeah. It, it's strange. He was hustled out, uh, of course, shortly thereafter uh, and flown hither and yon, but yeah. uh, it's very, very strange response. Yep. Uh, it is clear that the commander-in-chief, the president of the United States, is moved move to a safe area when something serious happens that is a potential threat. So They, they moved Dick Cheney, I think, quicker than they moved uh, George Bush. Uh, it, was, it was close. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. right, let's uh, bring Mike Fortson on the program now. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I'm very pleased to have this gentleman on the program. He, too, like, like me, has collected a lot of material on these events five years ago, March 13, 1997, and he was personal witness. His wife may be with him tonight. And with that, I'd like to just bring one or the both of them on and let them tell their story. They've told it so many times, they don't need my help to do so. Well, hi, Peter. Good evening. Good evening, Mike. <clears throat> uh, sorry, my wife, she, uh, it's 10 o'clock. She That's her bedtime, so <laughs> she sends her best. Hey, I got a comment on what you just said about the Clinton and this injury out of Greg, Greg Norman's house is, as much of a photo op as this guy was, you'd think a scar would be one of him on his knees. After all, we saw him in a wheelchair and the special braces and everything else, and yet you never saw a scar on that knee. 
and yet he was a jogger and everything else. But you know, he never got that one photo where he's pointing to that scar. That is a very good point. Right Mike. on. Very. Hey, good even point. LBJ lifted up his shirt and pointed to his That's gallbladder right. scar in one of the most right. memorable photos of his term. But see, they're they're declaring the injury as March 14th. But if you take Trig Johnson's sighting at 10:20 p.m. Arizona time, that's 20 after 12. East Coast time, which would be March 14th. That's right. Yeah. And they said nothing happened in Phoenix after 845, and yet we yeah. had the 1020 sighting north of Phoenix that came over the city of a interstellar craft with an inside area of over a square mile. All we, right. Now, that they, you just said something that a lot of people might wince at, interstellar craft. That was his testimony. Oh, I understand. Direct words. Yeah. But... Uh, well, it wasn't inside. from this world. There's no question. I mean, I mean, if you talk to the witnesses that were at the right angle at the right time in yeah. the eight o'clock hour, um, they'll be the ones to tell you. That's yep. Well, it, it was a, it, what it was was. Let's be honest. It was a tour boat from another galaxy. <laughs> well, you put that. They were on a cruise. They always said that it was. You know, it was like a, it was just like a show. Um, they wanted to be seen. There was no question about that. Um, there was three known V-shaped objects because of. At 5.30 that evening over Crown King is where all three Vs were seen. Who saw, how many people saw them uh, together in tandem or in, in, in all three at, at the at same At the 5.30 time? sighting? Yeah. I think there's under 10. I think it's around 8 people, but, and it but, was a sunset point. Okay, but we do, have, we do have around 10 people who saw three of these V chevron-shaped items in the sky at the same time, correct? That's correct. That's what the reports say. All right. And what happened was there was two fighter jets coming up from the south. The three Vs pancaked on top of each other, formed a white ball of light, and vanished. Yeah. And you don't see that report anywhere. You really don't. It's too exotic. <laughs> Let's go to your sighting, if we could, please, Mike. Okay. Could you share with us and our listeners tonight where you were in the greater Phoenix area sure. or surrounding area, what the time was, what it was that you saw, with whom you were standing at the time, what sure. direction the object was going, how big it was, and just sort of like a little news article. Could you share that with us, please? Sure. At that time, I lived in Chandler, Arizona, which is east-southeast of downtown Phoenix, probably around 19 miles. Um, I was in the sectional sofa. I was asleep. I woke up. Um, I looked at the television. It was 8.30 on the digital clock. I told my wife, who was standing right next to me, that I was going to bed. I put my glasses on the bar. I went down the hallway to the master bedroom. Our window was open. It's like six foot long, six foot tall. It's real heavy glass. It takes two hands to push, and I was pulling it close towards north when my eyes were attracted to the north. Uh, there was three real large white bright lights in triangle formation angled down. Uh, we're, in, we're in the flight formation for Sky Harbor, and I thought it was a plane crash. Uh, I ran from the bedroom to my bar, grabbed the glasses, told my wife of uh, many years to get outside right now and we went out to the edge of the patio and we looked uh, we'd be facing west but our head would be turned to the north uh, coming through the city lights very low was a uh, boomerang shaped craft that was coming through the city lights it was black the background was a was a dark gray uh, it stood out we we knew immediately that it was one object um, we were frozen in our feet basically we didn't move we did say a few things uh, we did watch his craft as it passed under a 737 that was in landing formation to come in and land at Sky Harbor. Passed under it. It went that under. That means this. it obscured the 737. It went under this craft. It, to the north of us, we watched it as it went under the craft that was coming in and landing formation. That was in my initial report. Okay, all right. Stand by, Mike. We have to pause for just a minute or two. Come right back. Uh, again, a magnificent sight beheld by a lot of people, but... Not that many reports in. Maybe we'll get some more from you folks who have them. Tonight, ufocenter.com, the National UFO Reporting Center website, online report form, is there for you right now. And we will continue.
And as we rejoin all of you, Peter Davenport and I are talking to Mike Fortson, who had uh, an eye full and a half. Okay, Mike, go ahead, pick up your story and carry right on. Well, some of the things that left the impression in, in our mind the most was, was the size, which I put it over 30 inches at arm's length. 30 um, inches at arm's length. Yes. Almost a yardstick held in the center, held at arm's length. Why? Well, Yes, me. From where I was, I put it going south down Alma School Road, which would have been two miles directly west. That'd be the nose of the craft. Mm-hmm. The end of the left wing that was towards us. I mean, it never passed over our heads. It passed in front of us. And the end of the left wing, I would probably put probably about three quarters of a mile away from us. Mm-hmm. And but from the nose of the craft as it passed in front of us to the end of the left wing was over thirty inches long. Yeah. So it could easily have been one to two miles in width. All the computers and everything else say about 6,000 feet, so I didn't feel bad when I said, you know, I remember telling my wife, I said, you know, that SOB is a mile long. Yeah. And, and that was in the initial report and everything, but the size is what really got me. And it didn't make any noise whatsoever, and you'd think that the, uh, the, the inertia coming off this thing would just be devastating, but there yeah. was no damage done whatsoever. If you'd permit me, Jeff, one more question, oh, yeah. if I may. Sure. How long did you witness it, do you estimate, Mike, from start to finish, and how did it disappear from your sight? Where was it, and how did it just leave your vision? Okay. I saw it as as it was angled down. As I was closing that bedroom window and the three bright lights, those were like the headlights on the thing, and it was coming down, and then it leveled off. I'd say from that point in time when I saw it, my total time was about a minute 50. Uh Um, The entire time it stayed in a straight line north to south, um, as I put two miles west of me down Alma School Road, and it just went out of view as, as out of view. It did not speed up and take off. It just went out of view very slow. What slowly. does that mean? You mean the lights dimmed and to extinction? No, no, no. I, I lost view of it because it was gone in distance. I see. It was out of my view. and It did not dim and go out or anything. It, there was, no, those lights never changed. They were, they were bright amber orbs all the way across. Um, they, they never changed whatsoever. And, and how big were the craft? Never changed either. How big were the individual lights on this object? The brightest, biggest lights, relative, for example, to a bright star, or relative to the size of a full moon. How big were those lights? Uh, closer to the moon, I'd say the the uh, the full circle, of the index finger. I mean, if you hold your finger out and point it at the round part of your yeah. index finger, it's probably be maybe a dime size. Mm-hmm. So quite large, quite prominent. Very large. I thought they, you know, we got to see them. Uh, well, I feel I feel that those amber orbs are actually like probes. Uh, a lot of people saw them as white. Some people saw them as amber. And I think when they're amber, the, 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 the probe itself is within the craft, mm. Um, mm. that they have the ability to leave the craft and they have the ability to, to return. And that's your impression? That was my impression. There's a lot of witnesses that saw orbs only, and there was a lot of witnesses that got to see the craft. Yeah. One other oh. question, if you'd permit me. You're looking west along Alma School Road, I think you said. Well, I'm looking the... west. Alma School's a north-south road. Okay. You're looking west at the object. It's very large. How long did it take for the object to go from that position to the west of you to gone in the distance? So it, because it was so small, you could no longer see it. Uh, I'd probably did... say close to 25, 30 seconds, maybe. So it must have been moving very fast. An object that's one or two miles in width in order for it to be a pinpoint size, has to be a long distance away. So it well, must have ro- moved a long distance in those 20 or 30 seconds. No, not it's, really, because it's very dark. It, once you get out of the, like we were looking to the north, northwest where the city lights is, the main focus of Phoenix, Tempe, Mesa, the I city understand, lights, okay? Mike. As this craft passed in front of us, and I'm just south of Chandler Boulevard, it's black. And it, it could be a mile away from me, okay. and it would just totally disappear because... There is no city lights beyond that point. But you said it disappeared because it was very small. So it could have just disappeared because... Well, just went the, out of view, Peter. Just because the lights dimmed to extinction. Two different separate cases. Is that correct? No, I don't think the lights dimmed out. I just think that it, it was so low and, it, and, it, and as it passed that, that it just went out of sight. Because we, we even went back outside and was looking for it. And, yeah. um, okay. It, right. didn't, it didn't dim whatsoever. I understand. But wow. I, uh, what a sighting. How, how, uh, Mike, uh, yes. how thick was this craft? We, we've got the idea of the, the, the dimensions in terms of width and length and so forth. 
What do we have about thickness? If I do it at arm's length, I'm looking at an inch and a half to two inches. Wow. And that's how close to a mile away, three quarters of a mile away. It was pretty much flat, is, is, but it, it did have some, some thickness to it, yes. Yep. How many and lights I, I, did I you see, pardon? Mike? How many big orange or yellowish lights did you see? Total of seven bright ambers. Uh, there was one trailer. Um, it was like, um, it, like a, a line hanging down, so to speak, and then there was a smaller light at the end. So a total of eight, but seven were on the craft. Mm -hmm. And did they maneuver relative to one another, or was the object... Or were they all in an unwavering, absolutely rock-solid formation? Nothing moved. Everything stayed relevant. Everything. You, you had a together. feeling, though, that this trailing light was hanging down below the craft. You know, I thought it was like a refueling line, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, like they'd, they'd drop a line down and, and planes would come up and they'd refuel on it. Um, it, it was similar to that, but it, 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 it was in my original drawing, yeah. There was like a, a line hanging down. It also had a, an amber light on it. Wow. Okay, uh, another amazing eyewitness report. Five years ago tomorrow already, the Phoenix Lights. And we'll pause here at the bottom of the hour, come right back, Peter and I with Mike Fortson and yet another guest to go uh, in our final half hour. full. Uh, Mike, anything else physically you want to present about that? Then I want to ask you a question or two about uh, the cover-up. Um, I would like to add a comment to what uh, you and Peter were talking about, about the lack of witnesses in the 8 o'clock hour. Sure. Is a lot of the witnesses didn't know who to contact. Well, always okay. been a problem. And, yep. and one of the things is everybody was listening to the news and all the TV channels were covering it and everything else, but for the majority of, of the time, these witnesses that were talking about what they had seen were being just, just really lambasted by the media, and that stopped a lot of people. Then you also had the two lead investigators. Um, they couldn't get past the 10 o'clock at night videos, and there's five videos out there that were shot around uh -huh. 10 o'clock at night, and yet there's only one real grainy video of anything in the 8 o'clock hour. Supposedly there's uh -huh. a new one in Prescott, uh, but that one's never shown up. Um, there was uh, the the um, missing tape at 1020 at Tree Johnson sighting, but that tape's been taken. Um, but they go with what the video shows, and there was five videos at 10 o'clock, and that's where they stayed. And it was almost 18 to 20 months before they really started going to the 8 o'clock witnesses. Uh -huh. And by then, you lose them. Sure. And fortunately, my job has taken me to Prescott Valley and Prescott, to the two main factories up there. I've talked to probably... 150 witnesses up there uh, between um, the two main uh, manufacturing points up there that I that I have accounts with. Um, I've probably talked to over 350 witnesses total. Um, there's a lot of people have done a lot of good things about March 13th, and it, it was truly a. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, I'm just totally blessed to have seen it. That's and it's changed our lives a lot. But I'm I'm just really glad that I got to see it. Yep. Whatever it is. 
it must have been quite a sight, Mike. Well, it's a 9.7 out of 10. I leave an opening <laughs> for the hand of God. And, and it took our breath. And there's very, I'm a salesman. I've been in sales for 26 years, and it's hard for me to keep my mouth shut. Uh-huh. But as this was passing in front of us, um, I didn't yell for a neighbor. I didn't move. I didn't go get a camera. I didn't do anything. It had me. I was telling myself not to blink. Any sound, Mike? None. Mm-hmm. Not a sound. Something that big and, and that close to us, I mean, it would have yeah. just been horrendous. It would have it's, done damage. It has to be also something you do from time to time to postulate who might have been inside, what kind of intelligence, how many. Uh, you, you could just go crazy with that idea. Well, I thought I grabbed it on video. I shot video on December 20th of the uh, year 2000, and... And I uh, got a, a daytime, and it's at 4.20 in the afternoon, and, and, and it's V-shaped. It looks like Tim Lee's drawing on USA Today of the March 13th that he and his family saw. And it's got five lights on it, and I got about 27 seconds of it. Uh-huh. Uh, but it was leaving. It wasn't just heading east. It was leaving, and it was going pretty fast. And I have a TR-143, but I still got about 20, 25 seconds or so out of it. It was pretty decent. Yeah. All right, Mike, thanks very much. Uh, good to pleasure. talk with you. Thanks for uh, doing it, Mike. Excellent uh, description. Wow. Yeah. Uh, he, he's, uh, it, these are life-changing events, yeah. not deemed worthy yeah. of the local media yep. uh, until they came across the Roswell 50th and somebody said, hey, well, let's plug in that old Phoenix, uh, those, that, that flare thing they were talking about. <laughs> Gee, sickening. Now yep. you know why I walked away from that, that uh, alleged profession Yeah. Yeah. television That's news. To your great credit. You're a person with a conscience, a person with a professional conscience and a dedication to doing his job excellently well. One doesn't encounter that very often in our society. Not much journalism uh, left in this country. Okay, let's bring our last guest on tonight, Peter. I'm very pleased to have this gentleman on. We're running a bit late, so I'm going to be very brief here. This gentleman would like to be identified only by the name Frank. We're not going to mention where he's located in the United States or in the world, but suffice it to say he was in Phoenix on the 13th of March, 1997. He saw this object. He is a very responsible, sober-minded individual. I've met with him personally. With that having been said, could we bring him on, Jeff, and just allow this gentleman to tell his own story in a few minutes here. Hi, Frank. Welcome to the program. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good thank evening, you, Frank. Sir. We have How are you? Uh, good. We have plenty of time. We've got about. Uh, let's do this. I'm going to do my break early. We'll come back and we'll have a straight, uninterrupted uh, segment with you, Frank. So if you would be kind enough just to hold on, uh, let's go ahead and take our commercial break right now and come back and uh, listen to Frank's description of what happened over Phoenix five years ago tomorrow night. If you will, tell us your story. Tell us what you saw. Okay, well, we were visiting a family in Phoenix, and uh, we were driving on I-10 um, all throughout the Tempe area, and I looked up to the uh, northeast, and I saw a, a rather wide grouping of lights that uh, didn't appear to be varying except around themselves, so I, I kept my eye on them, and and my son drove on home, which is in Chandler, and uh, just to the uh, south of Phoenix and close to the Indian Reservation. That's probably about as far south as you can go in the Phoenix area uh, along I-10. And I, as we pulled into his driveway, we were at that time we were probably three quarters of a mile east of I-10, and uh, I saw this grouping of lights uh, coming. Um, again as a group and uh, not wavering among themselves and um, I could tell that they were uh, grouped together because they didn't uh, they didn't change with respect to each other and that was the first clue and as they got uh, approximately uh, due west of me they were floating over uh, I-10 and I could tell that it was it was huge uh, the, the starry night, and as usual, and uh, I could see uh, the stars everywhere except around it. So I knew at that point that 
I could tell approximately how big it was. And as the the lights appear to be on the forward edge of this craft, and as it went past, it was uh, obviously a, a raked wing kind of a machine because the uh, the starboard or I'm sorry the uh, yeah starboard lights went out first uh, away from view, and uh, and pretty soon I saw just the entire block of light uh, being blocked out as, as it went by. It was obviously very very large. Actually, I'm having a little trouble reconstructing all this in my head. It's been a long time, and uh, <laughs> at my age, you tend to forget things. But uh, now you're you're uh, still in the car. No, I'm home. Okay, you're home at this point. Yes. You're you're at your destination. Yes. But you first saw it in the car. Yes, we were driving along I-10, coming mm-hmm. back from uh, mm-hmm. uh, somewhere along and out there. I don't know. We were so this was under your theory. under this was under your uh, your observation then for for some minutes. A long time. Yeah. How long about? Oh. 15 minutes, 10 minutes? Probably closer to 20 minutes would be my guess. Uh, uh-huh. I got telling my son to look at this, and he's a naysayer, so he didn't even look, I don't think. But He didn't even look. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. I've got chastised him about that a lot of times, but I looked. I know what I saw, and uh-huh. uh, it was very, It was like I said, it was huge. Uh, not a sound that I could hear anyway. Uh, was it was it intimidating to you, Frank, in any way, and, and your life's experience? How did you emotionally react to something that that was clearly enormous in the sky? Um, I wondered. I didn't know what it was or why it was. Uh, it was. I didn't realize it was that, that intimidating at the time, but in retrospect, yes, I it was more like in awe than I was anything else. Uh, I've uh, seen a lot in my lifetime, but uh, nothing like that. No. You know, I hear that often, uh, Peter, uh, and uh, not fear, uh, not trepidation, yeah. and just an awestruck yeah. bewilderment at the majesty of something that is that inexplicable and that big. Yeah. I wish I'd well, been it there. Pretty, it was pretty obvious to me that it was not posing a threat of any kind because it wasn't coming toward me. Mm-hmm. So any fear of imminent danger never had a chance to creep in Uh, I guess in retrospect that's all I can say about it because I didn't I wasn't I wasn't worried about my uh, personal Uh well being Uh the size of the light the size of the individual lights that you saw on the object or the craft Frank relative to a bright star or relative to the size of a full moon how big were the individual lights on this object much smaller than a full moon Mm-hmm. And uh, much larger than a distant star. Any noticeable color? They tend to change color, and actually, uh, uh, some would turn off and then go back on. And uh, you know, as I've thought about it over the years, I'm wondering if that isn't part of the propulsion system. I, you know, I don't know, but yeah, uh, at, at the time, it made sense that uh, why were these things uh, fluctuating pulsing. in intensity and, and uh-huh. duration of life? Uh huh. They were pulsing, is what they were doing, it sounds like. Not exactly pulsing, because that to me implies rather rapid fire. Uh-huh. Uh, these would a fading up would and down. And one would come back on. Huh. And that kind of thing. How, was, now, you watched this for a long time. Well, what was it doing? Was it was it in a straight, flat trajectory as you watched it? It, was it, it appeared to be going right over the top of I 10 uh-huh. and right down, going down towards Casa Grande. Yep. And that fits exactly with many reports from people who were actually on I-10, headed for Phoenix to the northwest, and the object went directly over them, and it straddled the highway such that people on the left-hand side of their cars were looking at the right-hand wingtip of the object, and people on the right side of the cars were looking at the left-hand wingtip of the object. It was like having Staten Island go over their heads. Yeah, I I sensed it was... I said quite large. That I think I said I said we were approximately uh, maybe a mile from I ten, and just had the feeling of being huge as it as it went. Uh, how as it how traveled, huge? Traverse south. Yeah. How huge, Frank? It, it was it was uh, it was quite a quite a thing to, to witness. Uh, we're talking about maybe a, a mile. Why do you mean? Uh huh. Or about away from it? No. Uh, how big was it? The width of it. Oh, the width? 
that if I had to make a guess, I'd say a half mile or more. Yeah, I, uh, I remember, I'm looking at it. It was it was low. It wasn't very high off the ground at all. How low? So, oh, probably thousand Do- fifteen hundred feet. Thousand feet. That's low. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you that's have the feeling? Uh, do, you, yeah. do you have do you have a sense that it was perhaps observing uh, the highway? Just tracking along. Well, it was certainly a position to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. Is this Peter I'm talking to? Or That's Jeff. Jeff. That's yeah. Jeff. Yeah. Okay, Jeff. Uh, it was in a position to do that, but there mm-hmm. were there were no visible portals or no body lights at all, like you would see on the side of an airplane. You know, a airliner. Yep. So if it was, it was certainly low enough and slow enough. It was quite slow and uh, uh, amazingly so. And uh, so it could have been observing had there been people in there. I, I think yeah. there had to be people in there. I don't think it just makes sense. How did you how did you react to the way the media treated this story with the, the, the flares and all the rest of it that came out in the in the subsequent days and weeks? Not at all surprised. Not at all surprised. Uh, it's disappointing, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, they don't. Uh, this stuff is never read with uh, or received with much. Uh, you know, it's, Enthusiasm, so. it's interesting how people go into the, the electronic and, and broadcast media, even the print media, and once they get in there, they, they, they sort of change. They adopt all the attitudes that uh, are extant in the business, uh, derision, mocking, they, they tow the corporate line. It's, it's, it's a strange thing that they, yeah. they do. They don't all start out that way, but when they get there, they all act the same way. Yep. Yeah, that's right. They don't... Uh it's fun to make fun of people and things and ideas, and that's what happened. What case. would the news be without a sneer, eh, Peter? Yeah. Uh-huh. They'd, they, they'd right. never make it, would they? Yeah, the the truth right. isn't good enough for them. Boy, that's a great story, there. Frank. And I know you had to go to some trouble to uh, make it to the program tonight. And, boy, am I grateful to you for doing it, particularly given uh, your, uh, your station in our society. I'm uh, most grateful to you for uh, coming forward tonight. Frank, it well, has been, very much. It's been, been an sure honor to have you on the program. Thank you very much, Frank. Okay. Good night. Uh, let, hope it let some light on it. Hope you I, did. It did. It did indeed. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. But, uh, obviously, a man of uh, an, another outstanding witness with uh, great uh, integrity, uh, depth, yeah. substance. You can hear it in his voice. I wish I could share with our listeners who that man is mm-hmm. and what his station in our society is, but I am unable to do it. It would put him in a difficult position, yeah. and we never do that here well, if we can avoid it, and we and usually can. I don't even know who it is, folks. So he's, uh, he's quite a guy. I've met with him, and he is impressive. And he did not want to submit a report originally, and uh, when we met, he finally consented to do it, and uh, I prevailed upon him tonight, mm-hmm. and I will remain indebted to that gentleman for being on this program, as is the case for all our witnesses. Well, it's a tribute to the respect that people have for you, my friend, or he wouldn't have come on. Well, thank you. Uh, It's been, I can't do a program better than this one, Jeff. It's largely thanks to our witnesses, thanks to you for doing it, and uh, it's a real pleasure to serve in this capacity to bring the truth to the American people if they want to pay attention. That's all I can do. All we can do is try to help those who, and inform those who want to step forward yeah. and move in the right direction. Those who uh, are happy to mock and laugh and, and and be derisive about people and things, that's okay. There's plenty of room to each his own. Bless them. Let them do what they need to do. I have a couple things I'd like to toss out, if uh, if you would permit me just a moment sure, here. Sure. Well, if people, three minutes, yeah. If people are interested in seeing an overview of what happened that night, again, I would like to call to your the attention of your audience the recent publication of the Encyclopedia on Extraterrestrial Encounters. They can go to our website, uh, ufocenter.com, and see that see that book listed there it will take them directly to the author the editor ron story they can get that book and read about the phoenix lights and hundreds and hundreds of other similar perhaps equally dramatic events and i encourage them to do so there's also an excellent cd rom that they can get that is uh identical to the encyclopedia they can use both and they're really very reasonably priced 
the Encyclopedia on Extraterrestrial Encounters, go to our website. Also, I'd like to call to the attention of our audience that we're going to have a dynamite UFO conference up here in Seattle over uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, the UFO Paranormal Conference, second annual event. I'm going to be one of the two MCs together with Kathy Anderson of MUFON, and if people would like to come, it's going to be a doozy of a four-day event. We hope we even can get Jeff Rents up here. We'd uh, love uh, to have you up. <laughs> he'll have to get his, uh, his uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> got to come up with a disguise. Right? <laughs> it's going to be hard to disguise that hairdo, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, for the first time ever, I'd, I'd just like to uh, bring to our listeners' attention that uh, we run on small contributions in the range of 5 to $25. If people would like to help us with contributions that go towards paying our phone bill, paying our uh, internet services so we can bring 14,000 reports on our website to the world's public if they'd like to uh, send small contributions. I say small because we like to maintain our independence of all sources. Uh, It would not break my heart to receive a few shekels so we can continue to do these programs, bring fresh data to the uh, public forum over your program uh, I'd like to throw that out there. People Absolutely. can get details uh, from our website. UFOcenter.com. And all of you who care at all about uh, this this business of truth and, and honesty in our society need to support Peter Davenport and the National UFO Reporting Center. It is a, it is a, a treasure that uh, we would be greatly distressed not to have. Peter, thank you. A wonderful program, a truly remarkable remembrance of an event that uh, in many people's minds changed history. It certainly changed their personal histories at least. Yeah. Thanks for the airtime and thanks for being there, Jeff. You got it. It's been a Talk great to you program. Soon. Thank right you. Up. Bye. Peter Davenport, and that's our program tonight. Back tomorrow with another one. We're going to take 21 hours away from the airwaves, but we'll be online at rents.com. 